Well, it's good to see you guys again. You ready to uh, play a little game? Yes. All right. So I'm going to ask some questions, and I want you to, to just shout out yes or no. Okay? Are you ready? So here's the first question. Yes. In the Bible, it says, God helps those who help themselves. Is that yes or no? Yes. No. That's a quote from the atheist Benjamin Franklin. And actually, the gospel is exactly the opposite of that. God helps us because we can't help ourselves. All right. You did good on the first one. Second one. The Bible says there is no God. No. Oh, it's a half truth. The other half of the verse says a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Oh, I tried to get you there. All right. You guys are smarter than uh, what I thought. Just kidding. Question number three. In order for our sins to be forgiven, there's some secret knowledge or secret handshake we have to learn. No. 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 Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. All right. Man, you guys are rocking this. All right. Here we go. As long as we believe in Jesus for salvation, God doesn't care how we live. No. No. no he does care how we live. Right. Here we go. Jesus' resurrection was not a bodily resurrection. Was that in the Bible? False. That's also false. All right. I may make some people mad with this one, but here we go. Mary, the mother of Jesus, never sinned and didn't have any more kids after Jesus. Is that true or false? No. That's false. All right. Here we go. Only 144,000 people are going to be in heaven. That's also false. Sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses, you're wrong. And number eight, you can become a god. No. Sorry, Mormons, you're out too. Here we go. I thought about not putting this in, but I'm feeling a bit spicy this morning. God is a Republican, an American, and everybody who isn't is going to hell. Okay, that's false too. Good. I was worried that you guys were going to miss that one. All right. Here's another one. Since I'm a Christian, I'm entitled to health, wealth, and prosperity. And God would never allow me to go through any pain or suffering. False. Oh, we don't joke with that, Alfred. All right. All of these statements are being taught in the church today. True. That wasn't a question, <laughs> but you're right. It's true. Actually, it's in the Bible too. That's right. We're going to talk about false teachers today. There are churches out there teaching shades of this. So what are we to do? How are we to respond? How are we to combat that? It's in a book. It's in a book. <laughs> We're going to go on a journey today with Peter, and we're going to discover what Paul meant when he said that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Because when we think of light, we think of truth, we think of um, good things. But when the devil masquerades as an angel of light, we get false teachers, we get false doctrines, and we get false hope. And so today I want you to see how a strong hope is rooted in truth. And this idea of truth is going to be something that you're going to hear over and over and over again, hopefully for the rest of Freedom Church's life. Because when Jesus was questioned in front of Pontius Pilate, Jesus said, for this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. The truth, as you and I know it, is under siege. Interestingly enough, Pontius Pilate then asks, what is truth? And then turns his back and walks away from the source of truth. I'm like, oh, just stick around five more seconds. We could have had it. <laughs> truth, we have to understand. And the best way for you and I to understand what truth is, is to understand, believe, preach, study, and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see Peter do that today. So if you have your Bibles, get them out, turn them on. Second Peter chapter 2 is where we're going to be today. 
But this journey for looking at truth doesn't start in chapter 2. If you remember at the end of chapter 1, uh, Peter talks about, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. That is truth. Then he shifts gears in chapter 2 and he starts talking about people who do not speak for God. And he says this, But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. So much like Israel had false prophets, the church is going to have false teachers. It says there will be false teachers. And these false teachers are ones that speak from their own imagination. They comfort people in their sins instead of confronting it. And they're going to be among you. They're going to be in the church. So we, as the church, we need to learn how to recognize false teaching, false teachers, and call them to task. And this is how we do that. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. This idea of cleverly teaching is secretly. That false teachers are not going to walk through the door of the church and say, I'm here to teach you false doctrine and lead you all astray. Who's with me? They're not going to do that. They come in, they speak well, they have really white teeth, they dress really nice, and they say all of the right words. But they use a different dictionary. So how you and I define the resurrection, they may say, yeah, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. But then you say, do you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? Well, that's a false teacher. Do you believe in heaven? Yeah, I believe in heaven. I believe if you're saved, you go to heaven. Is it open to anybody who believes? Mm, yeah, but there's only 144,000 people that believe. False doctrine. False teachers. Don't even go near them. Because their heresies are destructive. Heresies is, is just a fancy theological word that just is an opinion or a teaching that goes against the Bible. That goes against orthodox teaching. So they teach these destructive heresies, and I think the most atrocious part is they deny the master who bought them. So they may say that they believe in Jesus, but when it comes down to it, they're denying who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, what he stands for. They deny Jesus with their hearts. And we're going to see why that's important later. But what's interesting is it says the master bought them. Do you guys know the master has bought you? But his redemption doesn't apply unless you believe. You can know it up here, but until that redemption is here, it doesn't count. Did any, I didn't see. Did anybody win the lottery last night, the $1.6 billion? I, I, Carl, I thought you were going to raise your hand like me. That would have been a great day for you after your Tigers and Astros won. All right. The last time the lottery is at $1.5 billion, Somebody won the lottery, but you know what? They never turned in the ticket. They were bought. They were a billionaire, but they never redeemed it. Right? That's like you have salvation available to you. Jesus bought you. He shed his blood for you so you can believe in him. Your sins can be forgiven and have a relationship for him. He has bought you, but until you believe, you're not redeemed. You have to believe. So these false teachers deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Verse 2, many will follow them. How many? Many. many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. This idea of... Their evil teaching and shameful immorality and these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. That way of truth, when Christianity first burst onto the scene and people started following Jesus, they weren't called Christians. This wasn't called a church. Do you know what it was called? The way. The way. And so when you see like the way of righteousness or the way of truth, that's talking about Christianity and the teaching that it entails. And so the way of truth is going to be slandered. So these false teachers, they may talk a good game, but when you drill down into what they actually believe and then how they practice their faith, the way of truth, the way of righteousness, the way of Christ is going to be slandered. And it's going to be taught differently. 
the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel people, that's where they fall in line. In this evil teaching, their shameful immorality, it's going to be slandered. In verse 3, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. Woo! In their greed. These false teachers, all they want is your money. That's it. And so this idea of greed uh, is that they covet something. They covet a position. They cover, uh, covet a name or popularity or money. And because of that, they, they make up these clever lies to get hold of your money. That, that word clever lies is actually the word. Um, it means feigned words. It's the word where we get plastic. Do you want to know why plastic is so great? You can pour it into any mold and it can become anything. It can take on any shape. And so these false teachers, they'll say one thing when they're with one group of people, and then their words are like plastic. They, they, it changes when they're with a different group of people. They're false teachers. And it's because they're not preaching from the Word of God. They're not believing in the Word of God. It's like plastic. And they do it to get a hold of your money. All right, so everybody get out your pocketbook. If you love the Lord and you want to plant a seed, give me $10 million. No. I think oftentimes we need to be more discerning about where we send our money. We see those commercials, those tearjerker commercials that come on. Like, I'm not saying this is false teaching, but that Heather McLaughlin and the, the shelter, animal shelter thing, I just want to write, I want to empty my bank accounts every time that commercial comes on. <laughs> I, I, I start crying and start going downstairs, and Lindsay's like, did they play that commercial again? I'm like, yeah, they did. Don't fall for it. I'm not saying don't support shelters. That's important. But when people start with asking for money, they preach about money. They tell you that you need to give them money to get a blessing. Then we're going to take up an offering. Then we're going to repeat the, the, the whole thing. I went to a church service with a friend. And I sat down. Like, we sang some songs. The music was really good. We sat down, and, and the guy preached for 30 minutes. I took, like, four pages of notes. I was like, man, this is so good. Uh, and then, then we prayed, and I got up to, to leave. And my friend's like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, well, I thought, I thought the service was over. That was the sermon, and it, it, we're done. He's like, no, that was the offering message. It was like half an hour long. And then I was like, oh my gosh. And then guess what the message was about? Money. So for an hour and a half, false teachers. But God condemned them long ago. You notice what it said? Who condemned them? God. Not you and I. All we have to do is point out and, and expose, but we don't condemn, we don't judge. God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. So those are the dangers of false teachers. Now we're going to see the demise of some of these. And, and what Peter does is Peter pulls in some stories from the Old Testament. Remember, we just got done at the end of chapter 1 talking about the, the prophets in the Old Testament, how they were, were carried along by the Holy Spirit, how they, they taught truth. And now he's going to look at some stories from the Old Testament that show this. And verse 4 is one of those confusing verses. One of those question marks. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. I think so often we can get caught up in the supernatural. We can get caught up in this, oh, what are these angels? Who are they? What did they do? That we forget about the point that Peter's trying to make. These angels, it could be the angels from Genesis 6 that, that, that slept with women and had the Nephilim, which a friend of mine thinks is where Bigfoot came from. But then it could be the angels in Revelation 12, and no, he honestly believes that. I saw a whole lecture on it. And then Genesis 12, uh, it, it could, or not Genesis 12, Revelation 12, the, the angels that rebelled with Satan. The, the point is we don't know who these angels are. We don't know what they did. So we need to ask, well, what do we know? We know that the angels sinned. They went against the command and character of God. And God didn't spare them. He didn't spare them. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they're being held until the day of judgment. So God saw evil in them. He saw them sin and he did not spare them. He condemned them. And then verse 5. And God did not spare the ancient world. So we have he didn't spare the angels. He didn't spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. 
In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was constantly and totally evil. And because of that, God said, Hey, Noah, build a boat. Well, I don't know. It's going to take a long time. Build a boat. And during that time, Noah is in the middle of the desert building a boat. Not a lot of rain. No lakes nearby. But he's building a boat, and people are probably asking him, what are you doing? And during that time, can you imagine? I'm just building a boat. How big is this boat? Well, big enough to carry a lot of animals. And during that time, Noah is preaching righteousness. We're not told that in the Old Testament. We're told that here in the New that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He warned the world of God's righteous judgment, but they didn't listen. And because of that, all of mankind, except for Noah and his family, were wiped out. So God destroyed the world, of un, uh, destroyed the world and he dealt with ungodly people with a vast flood. And then in verse 6, later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is often confusing, and it's hard to understand sometimes, and sometimes we put the emphasis in the wrong place. The point of Sodom and Gomorrah is they were living a lifestyle in direct rebellion to God, and God stands up for truth. We can point to the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's more than just homosexuality. They were hoarding surplus wealth. They showed contempt for the poor and contempt for the needy. And we have to understand, if we were to just have the Old Testament story, we would not think of Lot as a righteous person. Lot moved towards Sodom. Lot lived in the city of Sodom. Lot was a politician in Sodom. Lot approved, pa passively or not, of a lot of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. When Christians, when we get comfortable with the world's standards, when we get comfortable with what culture says is okay, even though we know it goes against the Word of God, we're in a dangerous place. And if we look at the world, in Noah's days, and if we look at the world during Sodom and Gomorrah, we ought to be scared. Because the judgment of God is no joke. There was a commentator that once said that if God doesn't do something quickly in America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of the depravity of the sin that's happening here. So he condemned them. He turned them to, to heaps of ashes. And that's an example of what's going to happen to ungodly people. But, in verse 7, But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom, because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around them. This is a prime example and a good argument against works-based righteousness. Lot did nothing to be called righteous. But he was called righteous because he believed God. That's it. His actions, his behavior, what happened later with his family, something we would not call righteous. So we need to be careful when we embrace and accept sin in the lives of others. And then it goes on, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. The point that Peter is trying to make here is that God's track record when it comes to dealing with the ungodly and, and dealing with the godly, God's track record is perfect. It's perfect. From day one... God created the world. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden. And Adam and Eve rebelled and chose their own way and went after the desires of their own heart. And from that day on, God is constantly bringing judgment upon the ungodly, but saving and protecting the godly, the righteous. And that's what Peter's trying to say. The track record for God is perfect. Interestingly enough, as we look at this, the Christian has three enemies. Who are they? The world, 
the flesh, and the devil. When God talked about the angels who sinned and rebelled against him, that's the devil. Then he talked about the world in Noah's days. And then he talked about the flesh with Sodom and Gomorrah. Isn't it cool how the Bible all kind of intertwines and works together? I love seeing that. So from the first pronouncement of judgment on the serpent in the garden, God consistently has condemned everybody who misrepresents his truth. The God who judges also delivers. This is one of the things that keeps me up at night. Saturday nights I can barely sleep because I'm like, Lord, am I going to preach your word accurately? Am I going to teach them what they need to know to live a godly, righteous life? And a friend of mine, who Joe and Trish know, told me once, give them the word. Give them the word. Don't worry about movie quotes. Don't worry about this or that. Preach the word. Then I can fall asleep for a few hours till Isley wakes me up. So these, this track record, we saw the danger of false teachers, the demise of false teachers. Now we're going to get into some of the practical ways that you and I can recognize false teachers, okay? Now, as we go through this, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, some of this applies to me. This is describing me. And I don't want to burst your bubble, but some of this also describes me. But I want to tell you up front the difference between false teachers and me and the difference between false teachers and hopefully you is that when you are confronted with error, you have the humility to repent and apologize and make it right. Okay? And you guys need to know that the shepherds of the church and some other people hold me accountable for what I teach. And so if I say something that's not entirely accurate, eh, you may want to look into that. Which, praise God, it doesn't happen too often. But this behavior that we're going to see, uh, another friend of mine in the room said this, behavior is the barometer of our heart and what we truly believe. So as we examine the behavior of these false teachers, we need to also understand the heart. So verse 10, he being God is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. So these false teachers, they had a twisted sexual desire. Um, and we're going to talk about what that was here in a little bit. Uh, but they also despised authority. You see, when a false teacher refused to submit to authority, whether it's in their denomination or in their church or from an outside source, when a false teacher refuses to submit to authority, there's no accountability. They can say and do whatever they want. And that's dangerous. So if you're looking for a church or you've found a church, know that there's accountability here. And there's accountability um, for a lot of good churches in this city. But there's also some churches that have zero accountability. And you need to be careful. So God is hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire who despise authority. He goes on. These people are proud and arrogant Daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. Without so much as trembling. False teachers are proud. They're arrogant. They scoff at supernatural beings. So they, they, they don't have that respect for the supernatural world that we should have. So the devil is real. We need to respect the power that the devil has. But we also need to recognize who's more powerful. Oftentimes we put the devil opposite of God, don't we? But that's not who he is. The devil's a fallen angel. God is over and above everything. The devil has as much power as like Michael or Gabriel. Right? Not the same. Not, not you, Gabriel. You're powerful, but not, not quite there. You'll get there, though. So they scoffed at supernatural beings without trembling. So we need to have a healthy fear of that. Verse, verse 11. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. So these false teachers will do something that not even angels will do. And then in verse 12, we see these false teachers are like unthinking animals 
creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. So when it says they're unthinking animals, they're like animals. They operate based upon their desires, based upon their feelings instead of reason. They follow their flesh instead of their minds. That's what false teachers do. They're like unthinking animals. They scoff at things they don't understand. And like animals, they will be destroyed. Sounds like a, something you want to go after, right? I want to be one of those guys. No, you don't. Because it's not looking good for them. Verse 13, their destruction. Oh, sorry, before we go on, I want to say, what I, what I love about the Bible and what I love about what Peter does is he's really subtle um, in pointing out and, and kind of connecting Scripture. So we talked about the angels and we talked about Noah and we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah all within the story of, of Genesis. But if you go back even further to Genesis chapter 1, you and I are 1 and 2. You and I, before the fall, before sin, you and I were given authority and dominion over the animal kingdom, weren't we? And so when Peter says these guys are like animals, we have authority over that. And they're putting themselves in non-human status. These false teachers are. Oh, God's word so amazing. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. That indulge in evil pleasures is orgies in the middle of the day, in public. Evil pleasures in broad daylight. They're a disgrace and a stain among you. What do you guys do with stained clothes? You try to get it out, right? And then what happens when you don't get it out? You throw it away. You don't even donate it, right? These guys are like that. They're stains. You try to correct them. Try to point out what's wrong. They stay stained. We'll see you later. What always gets me is the salsa. When it drips on you, you never get salsa out. Or mustard. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Uh, they're a disgrace and a stain among you. Uh, they delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. So if you remember last Sunday, we gathered together downstairs. We shared a meal together and we celebrated communion afterwards. That would have been what, what we call an agape feast or a love feast type of a thing. Well, what they were doing is they were showing up drunk to these things. They were, we're going to look at, at how they interacted with women during these love feasts a little bit later. But they would be those who Paul said would take communion in an unworthy manner. That's who Paul would have came after because they would show up to these feasts. They wouldn't, proper follow, they wouldn't follow proper decorum. They would just kind of eat, stuff themselves, gorge themselves, oogle over the women that were there. They wouldn't share. They, they just treated communion in a very bad way. They, they were unworthy of the ordinance. They commit adultery with their eyes. That literally means they had women in their eyes. Every woman they saw, they, they objectified, they sexualized. They just saw every woman as an object to be conquered. Their desire for sin is never satisfied. Because they're not redeemed, their sin nature is still in place and still controlling them. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well-trained in greed. This imagery of they lure unstable people, that's the same lure as when you go fishing, right? Fish are really dumb. They will bite the same thing over and over and over and over again. If you have a hot dog, you can catch some fish. I've caught fish on a, on a plain hook before. Fish are dumb. The people that follow these false teachers, they're not getting the real thing. They're getting lured in because they're unstable. And these false teachers, they're also well-trained in greed. They don't just wake up one day and become a false teacher. They're trained in it. They live under God's curse. Whew, don't want to be those guys. Verse 15, they've wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, 
who loved to earn money by doing wrong. This is a story from the Old Testament where Balaam was going, and he, he said uh, he was hired by someone else to curse Israel, and he said, I can't do that. I'm going to do what God says. But then he's like, but wait, the money's good, so I think I'll do, I think I'll do that. I'll take the money and curse these people. And, and he gets in this ravine, and then the, it's one of the weirdest stories in the Old Testament because his donkey turns and talks to him. And as opposed to saying, why, why are you talking to me? He listens and, and interacts with the donkey. He has a conversation with the donkey, and the donkey corrects him and rebukes him and, and all of that. But that's what these false teachers are like. They wander off the right road. They follow in those footsteps where they will say what they, they need to say for money. Well, they were, that's all they're going after because they love to earn money by doing wrong. Verse 16, But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. Whew. Verse 17, these people, now these people, it could relate to, it could be the false teachers, it could be the people that are following them. I tend to think that it's both uh, the false teachers and the people that are following them. But these people are useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. This idea of dried up springs or a mist in, in, in the Bible, the water is usually an imagery for truth. It's usually an imagery for life sustaining growth. Um, and that's why Jesus refers to himself as the well that never dries up or the well that is always there right and so this, these teachers and these these false prophets these false teachers there's useless as dried up springs mist blown away by the wind so when there was a drought you would always look at the horizon trying to see if there was going to be clouds that would come in that would drop rain and and so they'd see these clouds and yay and then the mist was blown away and the reason why these false teachers are a well that has no water and a mist that never comes is because they are not preaching the word of god they are preaching from, a, from thoughts and ideas that are not about Jesus. And we know that Jesus is the only one that brings life. That Jesus is the only one that when we drink from that well, we will never be thirsty again. Jesus. It's about Him. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. Verse 18. With an appeal to twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped a lifestyle of deception. There's that luring people back in and this twisted sexual desire. Um, it really is about sex and drugs and money with them. Verse 19, they, promote, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. So you can almost guarantee that at Freedom Church, when we run into a verse that mentions freedom, we're going to stop and talk for a little bit. These false teachers promised freedom, freedom from authority. How good does that sound? Man, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, to whoever I want. That sounds like good freedom, doesn't it? That's not true freedom. Man, freedom from, from, from money. I'm going to give these false teachers all of my money, and then I'm going to get the blessings of God, and life is going to be perfect. That sounds like good freedom, but it's not true freedom. True freedom is found in Christ. John 8, 36. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Let's try that again. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. For you are a slave, the verse, end of verse 19. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. All of us are slaves to someone or something. You get to choose. Do you want to be a slave of these false teachers? Do you want to be a slave of sin? Do you want to be a slave of corruption? Or like Peter says at the beginning of 2 Peter chapter 1, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. Who do you want to be a slave to? You get to choose. That's the way of truth. You can choose the way of righteousness and be a slave of God, or you can choose the way of the world and be a slave of your sinful nature. Choose wisely. Verse 20. Verses 20, 21, and 22, uh, we have to kind of take those together. Uh, and they're also another portion of Scripture that's, that can bring up some questions. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. 
They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. And another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. This verse almost sounds like you can lose your salvation, doesn't it? It almost sounds like if you don't do the right things, if you don't check the right boxes, or if you return, if you profess faith in Christ and then return to your former way of life, you've lost your salvation. But I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. And this is why it's so important to study the Bible in community and to study the Bible in context. Because Peter here is speaking of people who've learned about Christ and how to be saved. They may have been positively influenced by Christians, but they reject the truth and return to their sin. These people are worse off than before because they've rejected the only way out of sin, the only way of salvation. And with greater knowledge comes greater responsibility. So these people knew the truth, but they didn't believe. They didn't believe. And we know that because verse 22 a dog returns to its vomit, and a washed pig returns to the mud. Their nature is the same as it was before. Second Corinthians, we are given the old is gone, the new has come. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you are given a new nature. The, the, the dog that eats its vomit and the pig that gets clean and then jumps back in the mud, they don't have a new nature. They're, they're living by their old nature. So that begs the question, what happens when somebody in our life says that they believe in Jesus, but their life doesn't line up with it? That's a great question. You ready for the answer? Only God knows the heart. And that is so hard for us, isn't it? Parents with kids, we want to know so badly that our kids trust and love Jesus in their hearts. We're not going to know. But what Peter is saying here in this whole chapter, you'll notice when he talks about false teachers, does he talk about what they teach or does he talk about how they live? how they live. We run the danger of becoming self-appointed fruit inspectors when we go around and look at someone's life. Oh, you still do you still drink. You're not you're not saved. Oh, you still smoke weed. You're not saved or you do this, you do that, you're not saved. That's not our job. God's track record for judging the ungodly and saving the godly is God's track record, not ours. We are to love, we are to correct and rebuke in grace and love with tact. Because you know what? God is the only one who understands everything. You and I have a very limited perspective of other people's lives. So we let God be the judge, amen? amen. But you can know where you're going. You may not be able to know if other people are saved, but you can be sure. All you have to do is believe that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon us, looked upon mankind, and we were hopelessly sinful, un unable to save ourselves. And when we believe in what Jesus did, we believe that Jesus lived the perfect life, died the perfect death, and rose from the grave. When we believe that, when we believe that that was enough to pay the penalty for our sin, when we believe that in our hearts, we're given a new nature. Now there's still that sinful nature that wants to come back, that wants to attach itself to us, but it's dead, it's gone. We still make mistakes. But that's not who we are. Your identity as a follower of Christ is you are in Christ. Don't ever forget that. There's power in that. So when it comes to recognizing false teachers, we are to stop, look, and listen. Stop. If you think somebody's teaching something that's false, and, and I'm, I recognize that I'm probably not the only source of preaching in your life. There's a lot of good Bible teachers out there, a lot of good podcasts, a lot of good sermons. There's also a lot of junk. 
So stop. I'm not telling you to stop listening to everybody, but stop and think about what they're teaching you. Think about what they're saying. Think about the impact that their life is having on people around them. Strip away the money, the power, the name, and who are you left with? And that's why I think the Bible is so clear over and over and over again that we as believers are supposed to be connected to a local body. That we are to have a local shepherd that knows us, that knows what we're going through, that can pray for us. And that's why we at Freedom Church have a shepherding team. Because I can't shepherd everybody. There's no way for me to do that. We have a good shepherding team here that can. So we stop, then we look, we examine what they're saying, and then we, then we listen. We listen to the Holy Spirit, we listen to the word of truth, and then we go and act accordingly. So let me ask you some yes or no questions again. Are you ready? God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. Yes. Jesus died for you. Yes. Jesus is coming back. Yes. Yes. As Christians, we get to rule and reign with Christ. Yes. That's so much better than the destruction. That's so much better than the junk that false teachers promise. And that's available to you for free. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, uh, you are a just and fair God. Please keep us safe from the influence of evil people. Help us to saturate ourselves with the truth of your word so that we will easily recognize and expose false teaching. Father, reveal to us the truth so that we may walk in it. Help us as Freedom Church live the truth. Help us know the truth. Help us to preach and teach the truth, even when it's uncomfortable, even when society and culture says we're wrong. May our hope in this life and our hope for the world to come be rooted in the truth of your word and the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Freedom Church says, Amen. Amen. Amen.